Céline Dion. My dream to be international star. Could it happen again? Could Céline Dion happen again? I'm Thomas Leblanc, and Céline Understood is a four-part series from CBC Podcasts and CBC News, where I piece together the surprising circumstances that helped manufacture Céline Dion, the pop icon. Céline Understood, available wherever you get your podcasts. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. I feel like I have to start by saying this. I bet on sports. I've been playing fantasy sports for decades now. And when sports gambling became legal in my province, I set up an account and I've enjoyed it. But then there's nothing really surprising about that. Millions of people in this country enjoy alcohol and marijuana responsibly too. It's the people who can't that we have to account for. It's now been just more than three years since single game sports betting became legal in Canada. And we're starting to get a picture of what that means. Not for people like me who place a few bets on Saturday nights or Sunday afternoon, but for the people who can't stop. The people who would previously have had to travel to a casino or use the black market, but now have it available to them every waking moment on their phone. As you might imagine, the outcome for those folks has not been good. So, was there anything that could have been done to mitigate that from the start? What factors in the regulations around online gambling, if any, could have made a difference here? What could we do now that might change things? And while provincial governments are busy raking in billions of dollars in tax revenue, what kinds of resources are they making available for those people who just can't stop? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Anthony Milton is a Toronto-based journalist who examined sports betting and its consequences for McLean's. Hey, Anthony. Hey, Jordan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for finding a little time for us. No, my absolute pleasure. It's, uh, it's been a big story, so can't wait to unpack it. Yeah, I mean, we like to start with some examples, and there's an example in your story that I think is uh, tragically probably familiar to uh, some people listening. So why don't you just start by telling us about Phil? Uh, who is he and what happened to him? So he's a man who lives in London, Ontario. You know, he's middle-aged and he's got a job at a, a food company. And he's had a bit of a rough time of it even before sports betting and online gambling entered his life. So, you know, about 20 years ago, he, you know, was living beyond his means in various ways, spending too much on vacations and life and alcohol. And he found himself going very deeply into debt. Uh, divorce didn't help him either. And he wound up, you know, some 30 grand in the hole. Around the time that Ontario legalized sports betting in 2022, he started to get the idea, hey, you know what? A lot of my friends are doing this and they seem to make money and the odds are really good. I'm just going to try it out, see if I can make some cash here and there. Now, these sports betting apps, they're also casino gambling apps as well. There's just a little tab at the bottom out of a lot of them that you can press and you go from betting on a football game to suddenly seeing 12 roulette wheels spinning on your screen at once. Right. Well, Phil did that, and he saw the roulette wheels spinning, and he thought, hey, I could probably make a lot of money off of this. And so he looked up some influencers who love to flog their trade of saying that they've got the, the best strategies, they could always predict where that little ball is going to land. And he said, all right, I'll pick my own number. I got my own strategy. Let's do this. And so all night, Night after night, he'd sit there spending all of his grocery money on the roulette wheels. And it's not like he'd never win mm -hmm. because they always let you win here and there. They are games of chance. And sometimes the odds will be in your favor, even if they're skewed towards the house. The trouble is he just couldn't seem to stop when he did win. Because as soon as you get a bunch of money, that's a bunch more money you can put in with the help of more returns. And invariably, night after night, he wound up with less than he started with. 
until a couple months in, his debts had in fact doubled. And so at that point, what are his options and and what did he do? So when you are that far in debt, period, your options are pretty limited, right? You can go bankrupt and therefore, you know, indicate to your creditors that, look, you know, you're going to do your best to give them their money back, but it's not going to happen with interest and it's going to take a long time. You can do a consumer proposal, which is a similar sort of thing. Phil had already gone bankrupt in the past. And so at this time, he decided to do the consumer proposal, which meant that he got a fixed payment schedule over, I think it was 60 months that he just paid down his debts to his various creditors. And he stopped gambling because, you know, after quite some time, he realized that that was not, in fact, making money and it was just thoroughly costing him money. But the trouble is, his gambling websites did not want him to stop gambling. They knew they had a good customer. And so what they just kept on doing was they'd send him texts every now and then being like, hey, here's a free $75 credit. Why don't you hop back in, spend that, and see if you win something? And, you know, I got to admire the strength of this man because he's been through the gauntlet. He's become addicted to this thing. And he can still find that he will take those credits every now and then and he'll spend them because... You know, he once made a oodles of money off of just a $35 bet. Imagine what $75 could do if he hit the right number. But it sounds to me like he's managed to resist the temptation to keep going even after that money is gone. And so that gives me quite a lot of hope for him. Okay, and before we get to the bigger picture context here, I have to ask you this because it's something that skeptics will ask when you propose problems with online gambling. Mm Mm-hmm. Phil could have lost all his money in a casino. He could have spent it all on uh, scratch and win lottery tickets. You know, online sports betting is not the only way to lose money. What's different? Yeah, I mean, let's talk about it in the context of, of gambling, period. One of the things that's different is that it's infinitely more accessible than a casino you have to go to. Like, it is on your phone, and your phone is wherever you are, whenever you are. It's open 24-7. Granted, some casinos are too, but it's hard to go to a place for 24 straight hours. So it's way more accessible. It's way, way easier to use. And it's easier to use for a really long period of time. Another thing is, and we'll get into this when we get into the specifics of what exactly Ontario did, but there are a lot of safeguards that are present in the physical, traditional gambling regime in Ontario and in other provinces that are not present in Ontario's particular online gambling regime. One of the big ones is called self-exclusion. And that is a situation where because all of Ontario's lotteries and casinos are run through one provincial crown corporation, OLG, the Ontario Lottery Corporation, you can get yourself banned from every single casino in Ontario voluntarily with just one step. Because you go to OLG and you say, I have a problem. Do not let me in. And they say, okay, you can no longer gamble in this province. Right. Easy. They did not do that for the online gambling. They said they would, and they still say that there's a plan to make it happen, but it has not happened yet. And so if you want to get yourself self-excluded from these things, you have to go to every single website and do it manually on every single one. And there's like 83 of them. Hmm. So that doesn't sound particularly good for you, from my perspective, if you have to go and review all of the competitors in an effort to get yourself locked out of them. Okay, so briefly, if you can, explain when online gambling became legal in Canada. And more importantly, I guess, what is special about Ontario and how it got that way that you're focusing on it? So... It'd be useful to start a little bit beforehand, which is prior to 2021, online gambling and sports betting specifically was not a thing in Canada legally. So gambling existed. It was run through all the provincial crown corporations like OLG and its equivalents in various provinces. But if there was an online gambling site in, say, the UK that was offering poker, or blackjack, or whatnot, or sports betting online. There was nothing stopping me as a Canadian citizen from making an account there, giving them some of my money, and then gambling on their site. 
and then getting my winnings back because I give them money, they give me money. No different than any other online vendor or service. Uh, the issue was none of that was regulated and none of that was taxed. Hmm. So the government didn't get the same kind of windfalls that it did from normal gambling. And also consumers didn't get the same kind of protection they did from normal gambling. If I bet on some black market site in China and they just decide to keep my money, I couldn't go screaming to the Ontario regulator for help because that's not their jurisdiction. That's not their problem. Right. So for years, like since at least 2013, lawmakers at the federal level have been going, hey, what the heck? You know, our citizens are gambling online at these gray market sites. They're not strictly illegal, but they're not quite legal either. There's all of this money that's going flowing overseas that we could be using both for government programs because we're going to general taxation base and we could at least be putting some of it towards like gambling addiction prevention and others and stuff like that and being responsible about it. So why not legalize it here? Those debates went on for a while. And oftentimes you would have people like sports leagues standing up and going, well, we don't know about that. Could compromise the integrity of sports. There's even more gambling going on. We're really not sure. Da, 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 da. So it doesn't get anywhere until 2018, which is when south of the border, the U.S. Supreme Court decides, you know what? Federal government, you have banned sports gambling and online betting, but actually that's unconstitutional. So we're going to strike that down. Hmm. Suddenly, states in the U.S. have the ability to legalize online sports betting in their jurisdictions, and they start doing so. So now the online gray market isn't just across the sea somewhere in the UK or China. It's like right next door. Right. And as it happens, Canada has a lot of casinos on the border of the US, like Niagara, like Sarnia, like Gatineau. Not quite the border, but pretty close. And so there's direct competition between Canadian casinos and American ones. All this money is still flowing over the borders. And the federal government goes, you know what? Time to close this loophole. So a conservative MP introduces a private member's bill. And by 2021, it gets passed with all of parliament support saying, provinces, you can now do online gambling and online sports betting. Now, that's important, though, because it says provinces, you can now do this. It allows them. What every province except Ontario does is they say, cool, great. Well, we're just going to do it through our provincial lotteries because that's how we've always done it. And so you can do sports betting in, say, BC, but it has to go through BC's Lottery Corporation. Mm -hmm. Ontario decides to take a different tack. They say, actually, no, we're not going to do this through OLG. What we want is what the U.S. has, which is a private market for sports betting where private companies can be the bookies. And we'll just regulate it and we'll take a cut of the proceeds. And so in 2022, a full year after it's now legal in Canada, they set up iGaming Ontario. And that is a private marketplace where private companies can become sports betting operators. And then that launches and it gets huge very, very fast. Are you self-employed? Don't think you need business insurance? Think again. Business insurance from Zensurance is a no-brainer for every business owner because it provides peace of mind. A lot can go wrong. A fire, stolen equipment, or an unhappy customer suing you. That's why you need insurance. Don't let the I'm too small for this mindset hold you back from protecting yourself. Zinsurance provides customized business insurance policies starting at just $19 per month. Visit Zinsurance.com today and buy your policy online in just a few minutes. Zinsurance, mind your business. Give us a sense very quickly of the scale of iGaming. How many companies are we talking about here? And do we know how much money is being bet in Ontario and in, in these private companies? We do, because Ontario makes all that public. So as of now, there are 51 companies running 83 websites in Ontario's regime. Last year, there were $63 billion wagered in Ontario's system. And that resulted in $2.4 billion in revenue. It's growing really, really fast. That represented a full 72% increase over the last year. And of that, around a quarter was from sports betting. Okay. Canada-wide, sports betting generated about $2.9 billion Canadian across the country. In Ontario, by my math, they counted for about 20% of that. And you've got 50 some odd companies uh, trying to fight over that cash. What does that lead to in terms of what the public sees in the marketplace? So you've got 50 some odd companies 
But really, it's actually more like a handful of big ones and a real scattering of small ones. So what the public is seeing in the marketplace right now is ads for sports betting literally everywhere. And the reason for this is because right out of the gate, a handful of these sports betting operators immediately made deals with broadcasting companies. So like, you know, the owners of uh, sports broadcasting like Sportsnet, TSN, various different things, MLSC, the Blue Jays, Rogers. They would partner with the companies that made sports a public phenomenon so that you would go on TV and be watching Sportsnet and you'd be seeing the ads for their particular sports betting partner quite literally everywhere. I mean, in the ad breaks, on the field, there would be a dedicated segment where those trusted sports journalists would now just be talking about betting odds. And you'd see the uh, logo of their particular sports betting patron just plastered all over the thing. In that first year, it was a bit of a wild west when it came to the advertising, not a lot of regulation. And so one of the things that was legal was that celebrities like Austin Matthews or Wayne Gretzky could get up there, make partnerships with uh, sports betting operators, which they did, become their spokespeople. And then, yeah, in the ads and on billboards, you could have Wayne Gretzky like hawking his preferred sports betting platform. And that was so huge, right? I mean, that is immediate buy-in from the sports culture to say that sports betting is here. We fully support it. And if you're a sports fan, you should be doing this too. So that was the case for about a year. A year in, after blowback from all over society where people being like, hey, why do you have, you know, my son or my daughter's childhood hero getting up there telling them to go gamble? Right. Ontario quickly passed a law saying, no, okay, we can have celebrities actively promoting sports betting. What we can have them do, however, is promote responsible gambling. Huh. So you can still have Wayne Gretzky in an ad. Wayne Gretzky will not tell you to bet on sports. Wayne Gretzky will tell you how to safely bet on sports. In my mind... That is not particularly different. And if anything, it's a little bit more questionable because now you have your childhood hero telling you that sports gambling is like totally safe and okay with just a couple caveats. Right. And this is what I wanted to get at before we um, get into what we now know after a couple of years is these regulations are still active. They're still changing. Like this is still overseen by the provinces, right? So what kinds of safeguards are in place and what's missing? Right now, my view is not a whole lot of safeguards are in place and lots is missing. So I had a chat with Dr. Daniela Lobo and she's a staff psychiatrist and also um, a researcher at U of T and a researcher at CAMH. What she was telling me was that prior to the launch of iGaming Ontario, the Ontario government and its provincial lottery corporation, OLG, and CAMH, which is the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, which is like the big addiction research and treatment center for the GTA. Mm -hmm. They had done a ton of research and a ton of collaboration with OLG to bring in, you know, the most modern, up-to-date practices for preventing and treating gambling addiction you know, that they could. So there was a great regime there set up with OLG. They had a whole research center uh, with provincial funding dedicated to international collaboration on this kind of research. There was lots and lots and lots of work being done. When the provincial government set up iGaming as separate from OLG, they decided not to bring those things into it. And so you have this parallel regime now that's not operating with the same kind of history of research and prevention that OLG had. And they also cut funding from that body that was dedicated to research, uh, interdisciplinary and international research, and instead redirected that funding entirely towards front-of-line treatment for people with gambling addiction, which isn't bad. Like, that is good stuff to do. But to me, when I see that, I'm like, wait, so you know that there's about to be a huge problem because you've just thrown money at it. But you've also, in doing so, decided not to know more about that problem. It's a pretty stunning display of priorities. What do we know about the demand for frontline treatment for gambling addiction uh, over the past couple of years? Have we seen a dedicated increase? We have. 
So CAMH, that same organization, they run a helpline for gambling addiction that is posted in various different places across OLG's regime and in various different places across the New York gambling regime. Is this that number that you call at the end of the commercials when they say that number really, really fast if you have a gambling problem? <laughs> it's one of those. Yeah, yeah. Try to catch it if you have a problem. Yeah, so you call that number, and if you're in the GTA, you get CAMH. And CAMH does a very good job at recording who's calling into that number, what they're calling about, and when they're calling, and so on and so forth. They collect all that data, and they compile it, and they see, okay, well, what's going on? What they found is calls plunged during the pandemic, obviously, because people weren't going to casinos anymore because they weren't open. They slowly started to creep back up. And they really started to creep back up as soon as Ontario legalized online betting and sports betting. They climbed big time. And online betting went from being a very small proportion of their calls, which is obvious given that it was only illegal or a gray market, to a very, very solid chunk, the fastest growing chunk. Of that, about a third was related to sports betting. What they found is that the callers tend to be young men Uh because that is the demographic that sports betting and online gamblers go to. Women, as it turns out, if and when they get gambling addictions, it tends to be later in life when they're in their 30s. But men start young. And I was talking to one of the researchers there, Nigel Turner, and he was saying that there's something very, very attractive about the sports betting regime to young men because young men, they tend to like sports and they tend to like sports stats. They're digital natives. You know, we're talking Gen Z here. They've got access to all these websites telling them, you know, what Austin Matthews is going to do next, most likely, given, you know, his track record and how many goals he's got and whatnot. And those kind of things can be bet on. And the sports betting companies actively, actively encourage this notion that you can be like a securities trader for sports. You can look at all the data and you can figure out what's happening next. And you can place your bets accordingly because you're so smart and you've got the skill to predict what's happening next. In Nigel's words, for men, the illusion of skill is enough. (laughs) We love to think we know what we're doing. We're going to put some money on the line. That's why my fantasy football team's in last place. Oh, we can talk about fantasy football because that is the progenitor of all of this. But yeah, the the delusion is enough. What no one remembers is that the very platform that's allowing you to do this has more data than you could ever dream of having. They're the one spoon feeding it to you or drip feeding it to you. They have better analysts than you can ever dream of. They are experimenting with AI and machine learning to get even better at predicting these things. And their entire livelihood is based on setting the odds that more often than not, they will win and you will not. When you talk to the experts about this, What kind of safeguards do they say could be in place that could help with this if we're going to assume, and I I think we should at this point, that this genie is never going back into the bottle in Ontario or anywhere else? Yeah, the genie is out of the bottle. There's far too much money in it now, and the government has far too much of a vested interest now. It's making oodles of money off of it. What I've heard from experts and also concerned citizens is that the marketing needs to be reined in big time. I mean, you know, the deluge of ads was ridiculous in its own right, but it's really, really dangerous. I mean, we're talking about something that is addictive on the same level as cigarettes and alcohol. There's a reason why there's intense regulation around ads for cigarettes and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Because, listen, not everyone, in fact, not most people who bet on sports end up remortgaging their homes. Right. And the addiction paradigm for gambling isn't fully settled on why some people are totally fine and why some people aren't. It's not like, you know, nicotine or alcohol where there's a clear chemical and physical component to it. It's very behavioral based. But what seems to be a relative consensus is that, you know, you could do without shoving it down people's throats all the time and creating this notion that is something that is part and parcel of sports. That, you know, you go to a baseball game, you get some Cracker Jacks, you sit with your buddies, and also you flip open your your sports betting app to bet on, you know, whether your guy is going to make the next hit or not. That's what the sports betting companies want. They want to become indispensable. They want to become part of the culture. They want to be in it everywhere because there's so much money for them when they do that. I think what I've been hearing is that 
that kind of culture shift is something that needs to be resisted because this is something dangerous and something dangerous shouldn't be part and parcel of sports. Last question, and it's more just looking to the future, especially if the biggest issue is marketing. We saw when cannabis was legalized that, you know, all of a sudden there were hundreds, thousands of cannabis stores on every street. And then little by little, the big players started to eat the smaller players and it got winnowed down. Is the same thing not going to happen here? And wouldn't that diminish the marketing, uh, at least to some extent? What should we watch for there? Yeah, that's a really good point. So that's what happened in the U.S. I mean, like we mentioned before, this grew out of fantasy football. And before sports gambling was legal in the U.S., there were two really, really big fantasy football companies that got enormous, FanDuel and DraftKings. And those two cornered the market together. They became what was called as the fantasy football duopoly because there were just two of them. And in fact, they tried to merge at one point and the U.S. Competition Authority shut them down um, because they said, no, you would literally have a a monopoly over like 99% of the market. Right now, both of those companies are active in Ontario, but there are also local entrants like the score that are giving them around for their money. I asked Ontario would not give me a market share breakdown of our various operators. So it's unclear to me whether we have a duopoly situation or whether the market is more mixed up. What I've heard from loads of people in the gambling industry is that competition remains super, super stiff. It's still a mad dash to stay dominant or even stay afloat in this market. So we're in a period of turmoil right now, and it's not clear to me how things are going to shake out. That definitely drives a lot of the marketing. However, say just FanDuel becomes, you know, the hegemon of the Ontario sports gambling market. It's got like 80% market share and no one can challenge it. I think we will still be seeing FanDuel literally everywhere because they want to be an indispensable part of sports. They want to be like every break in the game you will now be going to FanDuel to place your next bet. FanDuel or whoever it is that takes over the market will probably be the one sponsoring your sports journalists on Sportsnet or TSN and probably all of the other ones too to do their dedicated segment on sports betting. Like if I'm in that situation, I would just capitalize and capitalize and capitalize on my market share. I wouldn't just like quietly go away and be demure and mindful behind the scenes. I don't think we're going to see any less of this even if the market consolidates. Sounds like quite a future. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing all this with us. It's definitely worth talking about. Yeah, no, I agree. And thank you. Thank you so much for letting me do so. I really appreciate it. Anthony Milton writing in McLean's. And that was the big story. And just so you know, since Anthony mentioned uh, the plethora of sports gaming advertisements that you see during broadcasts, we reached out to both Rogers and Bell and asked them for a comment on those advertisements. They declined to comment. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always send us feedback by emailing hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us up and leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every podcast player in which you enjoy podcasts. It is also available on your smart speaker. All you've got to do is ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.